that we are um, we are participating in Advent Conspiracy this year, and I'm just really, really thrilled that we are. Um, my name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and uh, I'm so excited to bring you God's word this morning. I, I want to explain, especially for those who maybe didn't grow up in church, what it is that we do and why do we do these things called sermons. Well, we believe that the Bible is God's word, and it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And when we open God's word, we want to look at what was the, what was the Holy Spirit meaning to communicate in this passage. And that's why at different points in sermons, we'll talk about what is the point of this passage? What is the point? What is the purpose that the Holy Spirit was inspiring behind that passage? And um, it's very important to us that we understand what the Holy Spirit was doing and why he inspired that passage so we can understand how he wants us to relate to God and how he wants us to relate to one another. I am deeply, deeply concerned about something that is happening in our culture. Uh, there is a secret society that has infiltrated our culture. It has infiltrated this church. It has infiltrated my home, my marriage. I'm, of course, talking about the secret society of people who watch Hallmark Christmas movies. <laughs> You'll notice that this one is even disguised as a Netflix movie. But we know the truth. Now, this is your gut check moment. How many here are part of the secret society? <laughs> you guys are not very good at keeping secrets, are you? <laughs> um, I was warned on the drive here that if I say bad things about these movies, I will be forced to watch one every day for the next week. Uh, this is a popular one. It's been around for a couple of years, but we're about to have the third iteration, or maybe it's just come out. It's called A Christmas Prince. Um, if you have never seen this movie, do you need anything else other than the title and the picture <laughs> to know what happened? What I'm told by members of the society is that that's actually the strength of these movies, right? Life is filled with uncertainty, frustration, and broken dreams, and it's really nice. It's really nice to spend some time in a world where there are happy endings and dreams come true. And in these movies, the dreams coming true are not about castles. They're not about wealth. They are about love. How am I doing so far? I'm not, trust me, I'm not a part of this society. Um, <laughs> there will be time for confession later. Um, <laughs> There is a universal desire that these movies tap into. And it doesn't matter if you wear pink or blue. Every one of us has the desire to be loved and to have our love received by somebody. And what I want to suggest is that Christmas, and even what we're talking about with the Advent Conspiracy, ties us into the reality that this longing is a longing that has been fulfilled. And what Advent conspiracy and what Christmas calls us to 
is to make the reality that that desire to be loved and that desire to love have been fulfilled. And it is something that we are called to show others. And so again, we are doing that through Advent Conspiracy. If you're new to Advent Conspiracy, this is a way that we try to make God's love tangible for people who are at need during the Christmas season. And we are focusing on local needs. And if you were to stop by the table that's to my left out here, you will see a number of organizations that we are excited to partner with, who are working with children and families who have needs, especially in the areas of adoption, foster care, children who are a part of an orphanage system. We also have an organization that's working with mothers who are, um, or, or mothers who are in crisis pregnancy. And these are local organizations where we have the opportunity to make God's love very, very tangible to people who are in deep, deep need. And what we're going to be challenged this morning is that the way that we make God's love tangible is not just through the giving of money, but it's through the giving of ourselves. And as we look at one of the most famous verses, and in fact, one of the most famous passages in all of the scripture, maybe even the most famous verse, what I want us to catch is that this verse is actually a Christmas verse. I'm talking about John 3.16. And we're going to look at John 3.16 through 21. And in this passage, we have a religious leader named Nicodemus who comes to Jesus and asks him questions, and he comes in secret. And in asking these questions, the conversation that ensues is a conversation about this is who God is, and this is how you relate to him. And we're going to zero in on a part of that conversation where the topic is the incredible, generous giving nature of God's love. So we pick up in John 3, 16, and I could probably have a whole bunch of Awana kids stand up and quote this for us, but I won't put them on the spot. But let's read through it together, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go back through it and take this apart a little bit, and then we're going to go back through it and say, what does this have to say about who God is? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out. In God. What I want us to do is to, to take a look at an overview of the passage. How is it structured? What is Jesus saying in this paragraph? And then I want us to look at what this paragraph has to say about the character of God. Who is Jesus portraying God to be? And then we're going to end by considering how that character should be reflected in our lives this Christmas. Now, the point of this paragraph, and you're going to see this developed all throughout this, this section, is that God saves the condemned through a gift that will be received or rejected based on what you love. God saves the condemned through a gift that will be received or rejected based on what you love. And that point is made in three parts, starting in verse six, verses 16 and 17, that show us that God saves through a gift. And that's really the key word that I want us to focus on right now, 
is that he gave. Now, we know what the giving is. The giving was, was Jesus being born of Mary, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and was raised for our sins. So that he gave his only son. We know that that's Jesus. And we know that that's more than just Jesus being born. It's the whole package of Jesus being born, living the perfect life, dying that we can have a restored relationship with God, and then being raised again. And notice that verse 17 tells us why we need, actually verses 16 and 17 tell us why we need to have this gift. It's so that we would not perish and so that we would not be condemned. And, and so the idea is that Jesus did not come to pronounce a sentence of condemnation. That's literally what that word means there. It is to pronounce a sentence of con condemnation. Jesus did not come to pronounce a sentence of, of condemnation, but because we were in fact perishing. We were in fact separated from God. We were in fact living a life that was apart from God and we had a destiny that was apart from God. And Jesus didn't just come to say, ha ha, too bad for you. He came to save us, to change that situation for us. God gave the gift of Jesus to free us from the condemnation of being separated from God. The next thing that we see is that that gift is going to be received or it's going to be rejected. There are only two responses to the gift, just like there are only two responses to any gift that we get. We're either going to receive the gift or we're going to reject the gift. How many of you get fruitcake? For Christmas. Right. And I can tell by the response that a good number of you, if you get it, would reject the gift. But there are only two responses. You're either going to reject it or you're going to eat the fruitcake. The two options we have here are either to receive the gift by believing in him or we reject the gift by not believing. Now, there's a lot of confusion about what it means to believe. There are some in Christian circles who will tell you what it means to believe is to say the sinner's prayer, ask Jesus into your heart, without really any thought to who Jesus is, what he did, or what he calls us to. There are others who would tell you that what it means to believe is, is to intellectually agree with the facts about Jesus. I, I agree that Jesus is God's son. I, I agree that he was born of Mary and lived a perfect life, died on the cross, was raised in three days, and that his death on the cross was the basis of my forgiveness of sins. And end of sentence. Here's the problem. That's not what the word believe means. In either case, both of those have important points, but they are incomplete understandings of the Greek word that is translated believe. And so just to make them, I never try to do this, but this is such an important point. It's like, I'm going to actually pull out the Greek dictionary for you. Here it is. The definition of believe, the Greek word is pistis in the noun form or pisteo in the verb form. It means to entrust oneself to an entity in complete confidence, believe in, trust with implication of total commitment to the one who is trusted. You see, what the two other definitions leave out is the element of trust. I can agree that something is true, but never trust in the truth of it. I could never put myself in a point of actually trusting. Let me give you an example. When I was writing this part of the sermon, I was sitting on our back porch, which is someone who grew up in the mountains of Oregon is a remarkable thing to be able to do in December. Um, I was sitting on the back porch, and I see this plane fly overhead. I intellectually trusted that that plane would stay in the air. I completely intellectually agreed if someone would have said that plane's going to stay in the air, completely agree. Purely intellectual. 
I have absolutely nothing at stake. It doesn't stay in the air. It's probably not going to do much. But if I'm at the airport, and I'm about to get onto the airplane, my trust, if someone says to me, that plane is going to stay in the air, looks very, very different. Now I have something at stake. Now for me to believe that it is true that the airplane will stay in the air is something that is going to make a difference in my life. It is going to make a difference in the decisions I make and how I go forward. And you see, when you trust something and not just intellectually agree that it's true, there is something at stake for you. And that is what Jesus is talking about in these verses. Believing is saying there is something at stake. And what is at stake is the well-being of our soul. And the question is, will you entrust the well-being of your soul to Jesus and only Jesus? And the answer to that question is the difference between receiving or rejecting Jesus. Will you entrust the well-being of your soul to him? And whether you will or not, whether you receive or reject Jesus comes down to one thing, and that's what's laid out in the last three verses, and it is what or whom you love. The people who reject Jesus reject him because they love the darkness. Who's the light that's come into the world? Yeah, it's Jesus. This is a Christmas passage, right? Christmas is about the light coming into the world. And even though the light came into the world, the world responded. People responded by saying, I don't love the light. I love the darkness. Why did they love the darkness? Because what they did was evil. The people in verses 19 and 20 do evil things, and they like it enough that they want to keep doing them. They don't want their evil exposed, and they don't want the things that they do exposed as evil. And the contrast is in verse 21, where it describes those who actually respond to the light. It says that their works are true. What they do is true. That's a way of saying that it's consistent with God's character. And this is a remarkable, remarkable last statement. Their works have been carried out in God. It's the idea literally of what they have accomplished. Everything that they do is accomplished because of and in and through the work of God. The only reason that they had true works is because God worked in and through them. It is a work of God more than a work of the person who comes to the light. This is what this passage is all about. This is the point of this paragraph. God saved the condemned through a gift that will be received or rejected based on what you love. Now... Let's go back to our Hallmark Christmas movie. Let's pretend, because I can't imagine this ever happening, that in our Hallmark Christmas movie, there is some young woman who despairs that she will ever be loved. And there are two people who pop up who want to marry her. One is the rich and powerful person who doesn't really love her. And the other is the humble and poor person who loves her with his whole life. Is that, did that ever happen in these movies? <laughs> Which one does she marry? The humble and poor person who turns out to be the prince. Um, <laughs> just did a quick visual check. I have a feeling I'm going to be watching a lot of movies this week. Um, 
Can I suggest to you that if you were part of the secret society and you're watching the movie and all of a sudden the character says, I'm going to marry the rich, powerful guy who doesn't really love me, you'd be going, no, don't do that. Don't make that mistake. What kind of crazy Hallmark Christmas movie is this? Do you know that we have something equivalent that happens every single day in East Texas? Every single day. And it especially happens on Sunday mornings. We have all kinds of people in East Texas culture who are absolutely willing to marry and are in love with Christian culture because of all the nice things that it does for them. They like the fact that in East Texas, you can walk into a store or a restaurant and you hear Christian music. But my family, when they come from the West Coast, that blows them away. That does not happen in California. People in East Texas love the values of the people around them and the wholesome friends that they have. All the nice things they get from being in Christian culture. But here's the problem. They are not in love with Christ. And they do not know the difference. They have settled for something that looks rich and powerful that has a lot to offer. Because guess what? Actually falling in love and walking with Christ is difficult, it is challenging, and it looks less appealing. There are not the benefits that we see for falling in love with Christ and walking with him and walking in the light. We have a lot of people who are in love with the dark, but because they're immersed in Christian culture, they think they're in love with the light. How do we help that person? How do we keep from being that person? We do what the Hallmark Christmas movies always do. We get to know the true character, the true qualities of that humble and poor commoner. And when we do, we find it is more attractive, more wonderful, more beautiful, more loving, more to the core of what we desire than anything that anyone else has to offer. And we do that in the Christian life by constantly, again and again and again, coming back to and pointing at, this is God's character and this is how we see it. And so that's why I want to take a few minutes to identify what does Jesus tell us in this passage about who God is and what he is like. And what we, are see, what we will see is that our God is the God who gives. And there are four truths in this passage about the God who gives. And the first has to do with his motive. His motive is a desire for our salvation that is driven by his love. That the world might be saved is his end goal. And the reason that he gave is because he loved the world. And people tend to think of God as mad or disappointed in them. Others think of God's love and they think, well, God just doesn't care if I, I can just stay exactly how I am and in the situation I am. And this, his motive ultimately challenges both of those ideas. God's fundamental orientation towards you is love. It is always love. It will always be love. It does not matter what you do. His fundamental orientation towards you will be love. And although it doesn't matter what you do, to understand salvation, we have to understand that he is offering more than just going to heaven someday when we die. He is offering being saved from living and thinking and desiring all those things that will alienate us from God and alienate us from one another. That is why God gave Jesus is to save us 
because his fundamental orientation towards us has always been and will always be that he loves us. What is the means by which God gave? The means by which he gave are personal. Many of your translations historically have said that he gave his only begotten son. That's actually a fantastic translation of the Greek. The problem that you run into is it is an often misunderstood translation of the Greek. Dead serious about this. I had a high school English teacher who, when he read John 3.16, would argue that it was saying that Jesus was the only son of all of God's sons that were begotten. All the other sons were not begotten. I don't know what that even means. But Jesus was the only one that was begotten. And so what translations have started to do, because it is so easily misunderstood, is to point out that really what is being said here is that Jesus is the one and only. He is the unique. He is the one of a kind son. Jesus is emphasizing here the enormity of the gift that God gave. And we cannot understand that enormity because we cannot grasp the Trinity. Right? The Trinity tells us that there is real distinction between the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But yet they are more united than anything that has ever or will ever exist in all of the universe. And because of the depth of that unity, we cannot even begin to imagine what it meant for the Son to become human. There is absolutely nothing that you can give that is as dear to you, that is as close to you, that is as near to you as Jesus is to the Father. The means by which he gave was personal. The extent to which he gave was sacrificial and global so the whole world would know. That he gave his only son. And we said when we use the word give, we mean the whole package. It wasn't just be Jesus being born in a manger, laid in a manger. It was Jesus being born, living a perfect life. Ultimately, that culminated in the death on a cross and resurrection. And when we say that he loved the world, it is everyone. And this would have been a radical concept to the people that Jesus was talking to. Because when the Jews of Jesus' day thought about salvation, what they thought about was not salvation for the world, but salvation from those other people in the world. It was being saved from the people who didn't think like them, from the people who didn't believe like them, from the people who didn't look like them, from the people who didn't meet their standards. And Jesus radically turns that on its head. His love. His gift is for everyone. And I'm going to say with hopeful confidence, that I don't think there are people in this congregation who sincerely deep down believe that God's love doesn't extend to people of a certain race or a certain ethnic background. I really, really don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the problem we have to solve. I think the problem that we have to solve is sometimes we don't think that God's love, that God's gift extends to us. That our struggle is that we have finally failed to meet God's standards in such a way that his love doesn't apply to us. And what we are doing is taking what the Jews of Jesus' day thought and turning it on ourselves. Jesus' point was that his love, his gift, is for the whole world. And then last, there is the effect of Jesus' gift. And that effect is that it brings eternal life to whoever believes. In other words, the gift will accomplish its purpose. Now, eternal life is not just living forever after you die. Jesus regularly used that terminology throughout the Gospels. And it's a way of tapping into something that is happening now. It is life 
that is connected with the eternal God. It is life that is shaped by the realities of eternity. That is effect. That, that is the effect of the gift that it taps our lives into the realities of the eternal God. And so our thinking changes. Our values change. Our behaviors change. Our relationships change to look more and more like the eternal God. So my question is, does your picture of who God is align with what Jesus has described in these verses? Does your picture of who God is include that his fundamental unchanging attitude towards you is love? Do you see God as loving you personally, knowing full well who you are and everything good and bad that you have done, everything that you have tried to hide from yourself and others, and that his love for you is sacrificial? Do you see God's love for you as reaching into your life and pulling you out of darkness into an undying relationship with him? Because that is the God of John 3, and it is the God of Christmas. And our job at Christmas is to reflect the loving character of this God, the loving character of the God who gives. And that is why the third leg of the Advent conspiracy challenges us to give more. The way that God loves and gives to us provides four principles that I think should guide us as we seek to give more this Christmas. And the first is that we need to be motivated by love. Let's go back to our Hallmark movie. So let's say the prince shows up and says to this woman who doesn't believe that she will ever experience love, um, hey, I, I would like to marry you, but it's really more for a tax write-off. How would you vote? Marry him or not? No, why not? Because there's something inherently dysfunctional about someone who wants to be in a relationship but there doesn't want to be love. And you know what? We can enter into relationship. We can give of ourselves sacrificially for all kinds of motivations. We can do it because we feel guilty. We can do it because it'll make us look good. We can do it trying to earn God's favor. And you know what? All of these motives are fundamentally self-centered. Love is desire for the good of the other person. It's a desire to be in relationship with the other person. And so giving, motivated by love, says things like, I'm going to volunteer with Legacy Closet, and it doesn't matter to me if I get credit for it or not. I'm going to volunteer with Beds of Hope, and it's not going to matter to me if someone ever says thank you. In fact, I will probably never meet the people who will benefit from this. I just want to provide something that is for the well-being of the people in need. Motivated by love. The second thing is we must give personally. Let's go back to our Hallmark movie. So the prince says, okay, no, 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 I really do love you. It wasn't just for tax write-off. Um, but he doesn't say that to our woman who doesn't think she'll ever be loved personally. In fact, he's never talked to her directly. He sends the message through a servant. And then he says, um, servant says, the way this will work is, you know, we'll have dinner together. I just won't be there. It'll be you and my servant. Um, I'll take you shopping. I just won't go with you. It'll be you and my servant. Um, We'll hang out together. It just won't be me hanging out with you. It'll be you and my servant. In fact, I will never actually show up in your life. Would we sign on for that? There's something really dysfunctional about someone who says, I love you, but never, ever, ever wants to be personally involved. And as crazy as this sounds... I know of a church in this area, I was just talking to their pastor this past week, who they are struggling with the fact that they can't get anyone to volunteer for any of their service projects. But you know what literally everyone wants to do? Dead serious. I will pay for someone else to do it for me. That 
is not love. Love invites, inviting people into our lives. It invites personal engage, involves personal engagement. And there are so many ways we can do that. We can personally volunteer for Advent Conspiracy, but you know what? There are simpler things you can do that all of us can do. This week, there are people around you that you don't know that well. Invite them to your home for dinner. Invite them personally into your life. Third, we must give sacrificially. What if our prince said, okay, okay, I, I'll, I'll spend time with you. We'll have dinner together. I'll even take you shopping. Um, but everything that you get, you know, all your Christmas gifts and birthday gifts, it's just going to come out of your funds because I don't want our relationship to actually cost me anything. We going to sign on for that one? Something very dysfunctional about a view of love that does not have any level of sacrifice to it. And I am seeing a remarkable picture of this in several places throughout FBC that are so incredibly encouraging. We have couples who are meeting with other couples whose marriages are struggling. And each one of those mentor couples would tell you that they don't have the slightest idea what they are doing. It is awkward. It is uncomfortable. It is overwhelming. But what they are doing is putting themselves in awkward, uncomfortable, overwhelming situations in order to love these people in a sacrificial way and to give of themselves in a sacrificial way. They don't have answers. They can't, don't have a magic formula for the people they are trying to help. What they are doing is just giving of themselves sacrificially by making themselves available. And God is working powerfully through them. And finally, we need to give purposefully. Right? What, what, what if our prince said, okay, I'll go ahead and be with you and we'll take you shopping. And okay, well, I can, I can open up the coffers of the treasury and I can spend some money on you. Um, but, but when we go shopping, I, I just want you to know that... Um, Everything that I buy for you is going to be stuff that I like for me. That is the, you know, very little child version of Christmas shopping. Um, no, we wouldn't sign on for that. There is something profoundly dysfunctional about a love that's purpose is completely self-absorbed. What do you want to see happen with how you give of yourselves? Be intentional about seeing people move from darkness to light. If you're volunteering together with somebody, encourage those people who are working side by side with you that what you are doing is reflecting the character of God and drawing people to light. If you are doing something like Beds of Hope, where you may never meet the people who benefit from it, you can still take time and make it a focus of your prayer that the people who will ultimately benefit from these things will be drawn into, into the light and that they will come and experience what the light is like because people gave of themselves. We can be saved because the loving, generous God gave. He gave because he loved. He gave personally and sacrificially. And he gave so that we would come to the light. And the response to the God who gives is to point others to that light by giving yourself. And that's the point I want to make today. Point to the light by giving of yourself. Does it ever happen in the Hallmark movies We've already alluded to this. But that the girl who marries the humble, poor guy discovers after the wedding that he was really the prince. 
and we look at that and we say, that's just a fairy tale. And fairy tales don't happen. But do we understand that that is the reality that Christmas offers? Do we understand that that is what is true when we fall in love with Jesus, which to so many looks like a humble and poor choice, that what we discover is that we have entered into the light. This Christmas, let's unveil who Jesus really is. And we can do that by giving of ourselves for his glory and for the good of others. And when we get to the other side of that, when people get to the other side of that, what they discover is what looked like only a fairy tale is in fact a reality that has come true. So how do we respond? Again, suggest four ways. Just want to remind you that you received one of these bulletins when you came in. And there's a connection card on here. There's a place for you to respond to us with how you are going to respond to the message. And we want to pray for you as a staff as you respond to this message. Four suggestions. Rewrite the passage in your own words that you, you better connect with the passage and understand what it's saying. Every sermon is, at best for you, a second-hand experience of God's Word. We want to give you a first-hand experience of God's Word. Spend some time in prayer every day this Christmas season for whoever it is in your life that needs to come to the light. Share, invite someone new into your home this month. Invite someone to join you to become a little more personally involved in your lives than they have been in the past. And continue to support South Ward. I know we're doing, well, we're doing pretty well, but we still got some more work to do in raising money for these children at South Ward Elementary and volunteer for an Advent Conspiracy service opportunity. If you are someone who is sitting here and you have said, my life is best described by being in darkness. And the most important thing for you today is to take the next step in coming to the light. And the simplest way of doing that is to what the Bible calls repent, believe, and follow Jesus. Say, I don't want, I don't want to be in love with the deeds of darkness anymore. I want to put those behind me. I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, the Son of God. And I believe that he did what he said that he would do. He died on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven. And he was raised from the dead, that I might have new life. And if you have any confusion about that or questions about that, there are going to be people standing up here after the service. It won't be obvious. You can just come forward and please talk to, talk to someone. Maybe you've done that. And you said, but where I am, I, I want to take another step in moving more towards the light, of living more and more like I'm a person who is in the light, where my deeds are true. Again, I'd encourage you to come talk to one of us up, th up front. And if you're someone who's lived that way for a while, where you have lived in light and you're growing and growing, and more and more reflecting the character of Christ, you have a responsibility. And your responsibility is to look to those around you and say, who needs help in more and more walking in the light? And that's what you're called to do this Christmas. I want us to close in prayer. So I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward and I'm going to invite us to stand. And we close in prayer, not just as a formality, but we close in prayer because we have to. We absolutely have to. When you hear a message like this, when you enter into God's word, no matter what the message is, if it truly reflects God's word, then we are left with the awareness that there is a gap between what we are called to do and what we are capable of doing. And it's supposed to be that way. Because God never wants us to forget whom we depend on. And so we go to him in prayer and we ask for his help. And let's do that together now. Father, we do come to you recognizing that you have called us to give of ourselves, 
not out of selfish motivation that we might look good, but out of a desire for the well-being of others. Lord, you have asked us to give personally, to step personally into the messiness and hard work of the needs of people around us. You have asked us to give sacrificially, to give of ourselves in a way that it costs us, that ultimately reminds us that we depend on you. And you have asked us to give purposefully. You've asked us to give that others may be pointed towards you, that people who are in darkness may get a glimpse of the light. And Lord, our motives are always mixed. We will always want to protect ourselves personally. We will always want to hold on to what we have and not sacrifice. And we will always want at least part of the glory to go to us and not to you. And so we stand before you together as broken people who depend on you to do the things that you have called us to. But we depend in confidence knowing that you will work through us. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you are a generous, loving God who gave his son. And we thank you that that love for us never fades. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me remind you what we have said about who God is today. What Jesus said about who God is. He is a loving, gracious God who gives generously. Our job as we leave here is to go do the same thing to point people to the light. You are dismissed.